Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India discussing the context of folk art to understand a few ideas which were connected to the previous two modules. So, we are beginning our third module with the topic uh, that relates to, to the context of folk and minor art in India and the real meaning of contextualization and hence decontextualization and we will try to understand it uh, from the fundamental of uh, the idea that uh, where we are placing them, how we are looking at them and when we are looking at them, what is working at the back of our mind, uh, are we looking at them with a particular context, uh, what is the connection uh, that makes it uh, call a work of art, uh, why is that we doubt whether they are made for the sake of art or it has uh, some other purposes to attain. So, from all those things that we have been discussing so far, we are trying to uh, give some light on the issues of contextualization and the context of folk art. Uh, in the perspective of colonial and post colonial India, which covers the past 100 years almost, and we are again going back a little bit to realize that in the following lectures. So, the first lecture has uh, this topic contextualization, and then we are going to discuss about the concept of communication uh, for social purpose. And then uh, we are also discussing along with it the aesthetic perspective which works as the um, operating factor for uh, this practice. And then uh, there are another very important thing that we mentioned in the previous lecture, but we are trying to discuss that uh, in this context that is the secularity and uh, religious uh, purposes as well as the religious plurality that acts as a major factor in building up the uh, structure of this uh, whole habitual practice that we go through in uh, social context. Uh, then there is another factor that needs to be discussed thoroughly that is the ethnographic perspective on the study of folk art and culture and uh, how ethnography is connected to that uh, when the ethnographic uh, studies look at folk art from some like they, they find some significance of it, uh, what are the areas that they find to be interesting. We are just having a general idea of that in this context, because our way, our basic aim of uh, approaching towards this kind of a course is not uh, following anything that is uh, anthropologic. Uh, but there is some kind of an ethnicity which is connected to it and we need to see that from a proper and clear light. Uh, and with that, we are also uh, discussing the exponents who brought the culture under the limelight and uh, what were their realizations and how they are connected in today's context. So, this is a basic study to realize that we are going to also watch a few images to understand that. Uh, we are not analyzing those images right now, but we are just getting familiar with uh, the execution and we are using them as examples in our discussion. Uh, changes in the cultural perception prove uh, that there is no universal definition that determines academic art. So, ac artistic expression in modern term can only be understood uh, in the functions of specific social and political contexts. But artists are ideologically defined on the basis of their academic background. The consciousness is of central significance to 
contemporary theorization of art uh, and its practice and its role in the society uh, at large. The role of art uh, and uh, the viewing of art almost like the um, critical viewing towards uh, art practices, it plays a very different uh, role. It is uh, rather a discipline uh, where we see that it must be realized in the relation to the values of a particular culture. So, it is very cultural when we look at them, when we view them and uh, one has to be familiar with a particular culture to understand the meaning or the expression that comes out of this kind of execution uh, to get a general view of it. Uh, now, this is also true that uh, the aesthetics when uh, it is like a artistic expression that is uh, academic, traditional, it can also be naive or amateurish, it can be conventional, it can be um, conventional or professional or whatever it is. But the, it has to be scrutinized in terms of their aesthetic merit and methods may employ to construct an artistic uh, version of a narrative idea which is prevalent there. Uh, so, it is more like the role of art appreciation or art criticism or the critical viewing uh, then it, it, it just delay, uh, it uh, deals with the directness of the making of art. And that can be academic, uh, but it is it, true that the uh, you know that directs the making of art in line with the interests of the uh, critic authority, how the critic is willing to view it from his own perspective. So, uh, there is another concern which is related to it, and that has to be also uh, addressed with some seriousness. Uh, that is also uh, perhaps a concern that is the ability to comprehend a particular style, a particular genre uh, that, is that, that is indicative of a certain culture, the sort of image being uh, that is being looked at, uh, the compositional formation of religious and secular uh, compositions is uh, it, it has their own characteristics. For example, if it is a secular composition, then we see that the emphasis on symmetry is much lesser, rather it can be totally um, asymmetrical and dynamic, uh, whereas the uh, religious compositions can be also identified by the compositional structure which is more symmetric and centralized. So, this is how they uh, appear to us. So, conventionally, uh, when we look back into other cultures um, apart from India or like we shift our focus from the Indian happenings and we look into the other cultures. Uh, for example, if we take uh, some ancient culture of Europe which is also uh, connected to the medieval and early Christian culture, what we see there is uh, that there are also a tendency to use a lot of symbolic images. Uh, into the practice to communicate in a uh, social periphery. There also uh, had been one uh, urge that uh, you know what letters can do with the literates, images can do with the illiterates. It all started from there, but it is also true that uh, only textual messages were not effective enough to involve or engage uh, the common people into the stories, morals and uh, the other things that was involved with the narratives. So, from time to time this people they felt that it should be uh, supported by the uh, illustrations or illumination and then they took uh, a reference of different symbolic uh, ideas. Uh, for example, if we just go back and think of uh, certain European cultures and the kind of uh, symbolism and allegories that were used in those uh, cultural motifs, uh, we see that it, it also has a wide range of uh, bibliocal um, images uh, all over. So, conventionally uh, the religious themes included uh, biblical uh, illuminations, uh, the pictorial depictions of saints performing miracles, uh, the visions, the martyrdoms. Uh, the fragments of great epics. The secular subject matters also range from landscape 
portrait and still life to commercial images as main genre or the stylistic categories. Uh, such themes of art for ages were subjected to academic hierarchies which were eventually confronted by the wave of modernism. Allegory and symbols which literally means speaking with an alternative uh, term uh, as a common feature of a particular time associates artistic acts in terms of conveying the meaning of the idea by means of something which is completely different. So, those are more like using some symbols and one has to be familiar with those symbols to uh, grasp the idea. So, that needed a different kind of academic uh, training uh, to communicate with those images and it was very cultural. So, people learnt it uh, naturally, it was part of their daily life and being. So, it was not very difficult to understand them and it was not really separated and nobody really need uh, to struggle a lot to understand all those images. Uh, so, I will give you some examples uh, for example, uh, it, it was more like uh, you know some examples uh, those symbolic meanings were to uh, conjure the ideas like uh, eternity was always shown with a snake. Uh, that is in a spiral order and which is biting its own tail. Those images are very common in early Christian art and also much before that during medieval and dark ages. We see lots of similar symbols in the religious and secular art practices and uh, one has to know that it means eternity to understand it. Uh, there are also um, images of the winged women, uh, they are not the cupids, but the women with wings uh, that gave the idea of victory. The human figures holding an olive branch to depict uh, peace, the florid female figure bearing a wheat or some kind of crops that showed prosperity and uh, there are images of old hag with um, sunken skin and uh, limbs for poverty, uh, Venus always for love, Mars for war, creativity by muses and different types of muses. Christ was often symbolized by the uh, tree of life, heaven by golden stairs and there are many such examples which are found all over in uh, Europe. Uh, so, allegory and symbols. Uh, allegory is uh, the symbolic things that is known as rupak in Indian uh, classical theory of uh, drama and performances. Uh, those uh, rupaks which are which comes as a secondary factor for this kind of figurations, uh, it was much more classical than folk, but we still see a lot of such images in folk and minor expressions as well. So, uh, it, it's more like the allegories and symbols that we have been talking about, which literally means that uh, you know, it's an alternative term that uh, the idea gets conveyed with, that was associated with artistic acts in terms of conveying a meaning or another idea by means of uh, something which is completely different. The act ends up creating immense ambiguity for viewers with different culture orientation. Uh, it is more like if somebody is not aware of that particular culture, it will be very difficult for the person to uh, understand or decipher those images uh, and connect them with the idea that they are willing to uh, convey uh, perfectly. So, they cannot just do it from the common sense, they need to have certain understanding and some thematic knowledge to understand them. So, these are more like uh, approaching towards the icons, the symbols, the allegories and they are found all over the globe, uh, which is connected to the artworks which were connected uh, to a particular culture. 
So, we look at them from a purely cultural context, uh, unless uh, we understand that context or if we remove that context, then, then it may appear with a very different meaning. Because unless we are familiar with that culture, the images can be highly ambiguous. We will try to see that with some examples. So, a presence of allegory in art notifies its viewers about the additional layer of meaning hidden beyond the usual elements like uh, line, color, form, texture, which are apparent on the surface of the picture. So, we will try to realize that with one example, where in the picture we will see different fragments of um, a narrative uh, painting from uh, early 20th century Bengal, which is kept in a museum in a confined area with the framed structure. Uh, so, when we see the thing, we uh, must know that uh, also uh, this is part of a uh, tradition that is called as Chal Chitra painting. Chal Chitra means the backdrop painting, uh, which comes almost like an Renaissance allegory at the backdrop of the idol of Durga in Bengal in uh, eastern India. Now, when we look at it, we uh, see that uh, this is a supportive narrative that is created at the backdrop of the main idol, but uh, the image that we are going to see next is taken from a museum place where uh, the image is framed and displayed somewhere. Uh, and that too, we are watching it in today's context. And uh, when we visit the museum, what we get to see is uh, a free form, which is free from the idol. It is free from any other thing and it is decontextualized in that way, because it is separated from its uh, basic context. And they are shown as a narrative uh, arch like painting, which is independent of any other thing. So, it actually has a different identity, which is more like a supplementary image in one context. When we change the context and put it under a different context, it just gives us a very different expression, a very different meaning. And it is also uh, connected to the iconic and thematic understanding of a particular visual. So, in that way, if we have no clue like whether it is a Chal Chitru and which culture it belongs to or even if you are not familiar with the uh, images which are there, the characters which are having some strong icons, it is very difficult for a person with, who do not belong to this particular culture to uh, literally decipher the meaning of that uh, illustration. They can only understand or appreciate the quality of narrative. Uh, because of the use of its line, color, form, tone, texture, etcetera, etcetera. So, let us see the images and try to understand that. This is part of the picture where we see that uh, the images are made with a uh, strong black contour line. Almost all the images have that line and the delineation of forms are primarily made out of those uh, strong border lines. Uh, it has a surface which is not very deep, at least the classical or renaissance like scientific perspectives or the linear perspective uh, is not shown anywhere, but it has layers that divides the space into uh, a background and a foreground and also there is a middle ground that is somewhere in between. So, what we see in the picture is a human figure with a white body. In Indian culture, it is very easy to recognize this character as Lord Shiva, who is a prime deity worshipped by the Hindus in uh, uh, this country. Uh, but then there are other characters who are the secondary characters and here we see that Shiva is sitting uh, with a uh, tiger skin uh, drapery and he is sitting in a relaxed gesture, he is almost like a king or uh, somewhere the figure is getting some kind of an importance, uh, because the entire thing is part of uh, a context where it was using 
it, it was used as an allegory. At the same time, the other figures at the background of Shiva uh, is also working as a secondary allegory for the picture. So, it is a continuous frame and let us see it from uh, its left to right formation now. So, this part is the left and the beginning of the scroll. The entire painting has an order which goes from left to right and this is in a semicircular formation uh, which is put somewhere in the uh, museum, uh, Guru Sadhadat Museum in Kolkata. What we see in the picture are some elephants and horses and there is another goddess uh, which is uh, like uh, it, it has a very strong iconic feature. Uh, it is a goddess with some uh, dark blue skin color and she is fighting with the opponents. And most interestingly what we see in the picture if uh, this is connected to any other thing uh, which is connected to some religious stories then there is also a presence of a flag which is the Indian flag in the picture which has the tricolor. The other symbols the motifs are not shown the so it is not the Indian official flag but it has the color combination of the national flag. And that gives us a nationalistic element which was very common for that time. Then uh, the blue bordered goddess in our culture is very uh, simply or easily identified as the goddess Kali. Uh, she is fighting with uh, another group uh, and there are there like she is uh, facing the war, she is confronting the uh, enemies, the opponents. Then the frame gets continued and let us see it in close up. Then we see in the second frame which is a continuation of that, uh, that there are gods like Brahma uh, seen in the picture are his many heads. So, through that iconic feature we are able to identify this image as the image of Brahma and then there are other people who are coming and approaching Shiva which is the uh, who has the uh, position of some uh, authority. So, the authoritative figure of Shiva is placed right at the center and the scroll is going from left to right. So, it has a symmetry asymmetry condition where asymmetry is getting emphasized. So, Kali was fighting and then the gods and also the asuras the demons they come and meet Shiva. They want him to do something about it which is uh, generally understood by the images. And then also we see that uh, these are the detail of the images where we again get to see Shiva in focus and that is uh, the center of the picture. There are other images and attendants of Shiva. Then we see the same blue skinned uh, lady uh, is perhaps defeated temporarily and uh, she is ill. She is not in good health and a doctor is checking uh, her uh, like they are doing conducting a health checkup and other people are concerned about her. And then finally, in the frame it shows that this lady is again getting uh, converted into a different image of Durga, uh, which is the same lady with a different feature. She has a yellowish pale skin color. So, it just gives us the idea that this is the same form of uh, the mother goddess who was in the form of uh, a blue bordered uh, Kali and then she transfers into Durga. So, we need a lot of cultural reference to understand it partially and fully. And then in the last form we see the same thing that Durga is getting active and then at the end we see that she is also fighting with the same group the opponents and at the back there is a uh, Indian national flag which is there in the picture 
So, there are two groups of enemies which are fighting. The green ones are from some other group with the flag and the red ones are in the front. So, it comes with a lot of ambiguity. At the same time, there are certain things that we can easily identify if we belong to a particular culture. So, with that particular image, in one sense, we were trying to understand one concept that how we should look at an image uh, as a general viewer that uh, if we understand or if we are able to recognize some of its characters, then it enhances the uh, enjoyment to some extent, but even if uh, we are not able to understand it completely. Uh, the ambiguity can also give us a different kind of a pleasure. That happens when we look at uh, the images from other culture. So, uh, the cultural context is completely dynamic, it shifts from uh, time to time. For example, uh, what we have seen now was part of a context as we said, it was the entire scroll, the entire narration where Kali is getting transformed into the Durga. So, the strength uh, that is transformed and Shiv is creating this two mother goddesses and Brahma is also responsible for the creation. The only thing is Kali was defeated and uh, Durga takes over and the central strength remains the same. So, this whole narrative is part of uh, uh, idol and uh, it used to be like that and that time it was uh, an allegory itself. Whereas, when we separate them and look at them separately, then we see that uh, there are other factors, the secondary images and the pictures are working as allegory there. Uh, for example, there are that national flag or the images where we see a uh, certain um, lady who is uh, nobody, but just a general attendant of uh, Shiva and as well as the, um, the mother goddess. Uh, she was wearing a transparent drapery, which is typical of uh, Kalighat Arban Patachitra. So, there are multiple influences and we can go to the deeper core of its thematic and iconic understanding and we can go on and on in understanding them. Uh, so, coming back to our context, uh, I will quote a very different thing from uh, another scholar, but before that I would also like uh, you to understand things from a general perspective, where no academic things are connected, but we try to understand it from a general worldview. It is a common human tendency that when we want to transform a space into a different space. For example, uh, we have a table or a pedestal which is used for a common purpose, but we want uh, one religious idol to be placed there. So, in that particular time, what we do that we try to make the pedestal or that uh, platform uh, into a separate platform. So, we uh, generally wash it, clean it, we also decorate it with some motor and that way that uh, usual platform gets transformed into the place of worship. Uh, this is common for all religious activities or the customary rites, even when we go for a general performance, we make sure the prop is properly set, the context is uh, set there. So, all these things are more like having a center where we try to uh, accumulate as much uh, energy as possible and uh, that becomes the context of our um, performance or anything that takes place there in the form of art, in the form of uh, any other thing that is related to art. Uh, so, this is how we change one context into another context. So, one idol, idol may get worshipped in one culture, but if we pick it up and we do not recognize it as a god or goddess or and then we use you just uh, appreciate it for its beauty of making, 
uh, it does not remain the object of fear to us, I can place it anywhere if I am ignorant of that particular uh, religion or culture. So, that is how it is all uh, connected. So, I am quoting from Kapila Vatsayan 1997, she writes, all ritual first establishes a point, a metaphorical center around which lines are drawn to make triangles, squares and circles of great symbolic value. Notions of space and time are comprehended through it. Indian folk paintings fundamentally adhere to a few norms by either following them or simply negating them. In either case, a viewer requires some prior cultural uh, understanding to decode the visual image. General viewing of these compositions may not lead to their identification as religious or secular. As religion here is meant to reach out the common people and therefore not bound to maintain a centralized symmetrical outer structure for it. There are images that are secular, but due to the progressive content are full of icons and symbols. Nevertheless, all folk expressions has a religious root and that is evident in the compositional formations and elementary style. In contemporary scene, the definition of folk art can be free flowing and ever changing. To encipher the orderly constructions of space in traditional folk painting, we cannot depend on a single image, but to a particular style or genre. This is a, when we look at uh, some image from uh, Madhubani, Bihar, uh, let us use them as an example and try to understand it. This is an image from Madhubani, Bihar commonly devoted to the wall of a bridal chamber, a significant ritualistic practice of the region that is locally known as Kohbar. The lotus pond and paired fish symbolizes female beauty and fertility. The bamboo stands for male lineage, pairs of fish, lovebirds, snakes and turtles are common in this kind of paintings with some variations with the beaming sun and moon are common elements that elicits the prosperity aspect of it. The conception of the space division is centralized and symmetrical to ensure harmony in the composition. The image is linear and radially balanced with a distinct point at the center, around which images that are symbolically related to fertility are drawn to, to adequately fill up the space in an orderly formation. The apparently intricate and semi-recognizable motifs are the derivatives of natural elements uh, like uh, flowers, weeds, seeds aquatic animals, amphibians and reptiles. The compositional formation is confirmed within the boundary of squares and circles which uh, is decorative and repetitive patterns to ensure a clear readability to the heavily crowded visual. So, the space organization has some symmetrical order, but it is not in complete symmetry. It has uh, some bit of an imperfect uh, order which gave it some kind of a life. So, an example uh, from Madhubani uh, is also talking about the non-dualism or the not two uh, in its pre-manifestation as they are. Uh, so, it is complete whole and indifferent as a point which is like the bindu or a dot at the center into which uh, all will ultimately withdraw and get spreaded and that is radial, uh, the radiant quality, the spread or uh, pulling things from the center, going off center, again converging into the center is one expressionistic aspect of it. Now, when we look at this cobra, which is painted on a uh, paper surface which is not actually made on the mud wall 
for a ritualistic purpose and it is just looked at as a creative expression it is shown into a different context and then it may change its meaning to some extent so this is very important for us to see it from a context where uh, the artists uh, and their habitual uh, leaving is connected to a particular artistic expression and then when they are separated from its existing context and it is taken out uh, and decontextualized, it faces a completely different challenge of being uh, free from all its thematic and iconic understanding and they are shown uh, free from any culture specific uh, connotations and they are completely shown as artistic expressions and there lies the basic challenge for this kind of artworks to uh, be able to sustain its quality and survive in the modern context.